Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by MarketFi. I'm your co-host, Joel Alconan, along with Brianna Valeski. And we have Tim Melvin on, the author of the Deep Value Letter. Tim, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Joel. It's good to be back on. It's been a while. Yeah, it has. And uh, if my memory serves me correctly, you have a little bit of a penchant for the ponies. And uh, I just wondered if you had any action on the Triple Crown or your take on uh, American Pharaoh and his incredible feat. American Pharaoh's a great horse. I was really, frankly, shocked that he uh, was able to hold off the uh, the fresh horses in, in the uh, Belmont. I was, I was surprised. The only ticket I cashed the whole triple crown was frosted to place uh, last Sunday. So, and the only, the only ticket I cashed was one that Lisa made my wife. And, uh, I lamented not wheeling him in the perfecta in the Preakness. So she goes, you got to do it in the, in the Belmont. And that's what I did. So I did, did have the winner on that. Well, Tim, we talk about a lot of different things on the show and we like try, try and talk from a long-term perspective. And we try and talk the, about value in the market and, uh, Boy, oh boy, I know I've said this to you a thousand times here. Mark it up at all-time highs. You run your scans. What do you see? I mean, just on a percentage basis uh, on your scans, what are you seeing for value is, in the market? This is, as, this is as thin as it's ever been. Um, it's just it's insane. I've just When I run the screens, I'm seeing almost nothing new that's cheap. I mean, it's just a small handful of names that we're actually finding now, fortunately, if you get away from that and you get into just the uh, small banks, there's still some opportunity. Okay. All right. So let's uh, start. And, I don't know if we have any ones to follow up on or do you want to talk about some new ones? Well, just as a quick follow up, I mean, it's been a while since I've been on. Since then, we've actually had three takeovers Whoa. bringing us to four, four for the year. Uh, last year in the main, uh, last week, rather, in the main portfolio, uh, Naugatuck Valley um, was taken over. And we've had two of our super small banks taken over at huge premiums. So we're at four takeovers in the portfolio for the banking on profits this year with an average gain of 52%. Okay. And uh, so, could you just give us uh, the, well, the charts probably aren't around anymore, but could you, could you tell us who the acquirers are? Because I, I find it interesting. Do you take the stock of the acquirer or if it's a cash deal or what do you, what do you do? Do you just do your analysis once again and uh, start yeah. from scratch? Yes, We've we've kept some, we've sold some. It all depends on who the acquiring bank is. It's, we had a, a Bank of the Ozarks took over one of our banks earlier this year. And while I love Bank of the Ozarks, and it's one of the best-run franchises out there, it's well over 1.5 times book value. So I just have no interest in owning the stock at that level. So we just sold the shares of our bank uh, rather than take Bank of the Ozarks. When Home Trust took over one of our banks, HTBI, we took Home Trust stock because we like where they are in North Carolina, and the stock was less than 90% of book value. So it's case by case. Okay. And uh, what's the symbol of that Home Trust there? HTBI. H uh, they're in North Carolina. They're expanding into Tennessee and Virginia. That's, uh, that's an area where there's an enormous amount of activity, and there's going to be more uh, through that, that mid-southeast region, I'll call it. Uh, and the stock's reasonably priced. I really like management there. I expect them to continue to grow by acquisition. But I'm not going to be shocked if a larger bank comes in and just buys them. Yeah, I'd like to see a breakout over 16 here. Have you found any trends on a regional basis? Has it been pretty spread out? Or has it been more, you know, the, the south or, you know, the, the places it's, where it's growing? That's, that's a great question. It's really been in the last year we're seeing it in the uh, Midwest. And the southeast have been the most active. But we're starting to see some heating up in uh, the western state markets. Um, there's been a lot of noise about, you know, people talking, the bankers talking about, you know, wanting to expand in Oregon, Washington, California. Uh, one of our baby banks, and we don't even t tell names on these because they're under 10 million market cap, uh, got taken over in the L.A. area. And that was at 100 percent premium to what we paid for it. Well, I want you to know that at least Dennis, my partner, is paying attention to you because he bought bank on his recommendation, B-A-N-C, and he's loving that chart there. I don't know if you – have you been on yet this year? I think he has been. Uh, earlier this year, yeah. Okay. And you guys, you, guys, you guys have forgotten about your old buddy Tim down here in Florida, you know? No, no, no. We're going to – 
I'm sorry about that, Tim. You forgot no, about I was, us. You know I'm teasing. You forgot you about us the other day, so I guess we're even. I, I did. I totally did Friday, and I have to apologize. Bank of California. That, that, Bank of California. What's going on with that one? I, you know, they bought those branches from Bank Popular. They're just getting their act together, participating in, in you know, the economic recovery, the real estate recovery in California. Um, you know, long term, I think it's just a fantastic bank to own. Okay. All right. So what is popping up on your radar now? Well, there was a thrift conversion earlier this year. It's First Northwest Bank Corp, FNWB. I like everything about this bank. They converted from uh, uh, mutual thrift status to stockholder-owned institution. These, uh, over the years, have been wildly profitable. Uh, Michael Price has been a buyer. Pretty much, if there's anybody associated with bank stock investing, they've been buying this thing, uh, buying it on the offering. It's trading at 84% a book. It's about as far north in Washington State as you could go in Port Angeles. You could probably uh, hit a golf ball from one of their branches into Canada if you were pretty good. <laughs> but, uh, you know, solid balance sheet, uh, good institutional ownership, a few activists in there. Uh, so, th- you know, down the road a few years, I think that the bank will probably get taken over in a heavy tourist uh, region of Washington State. Uh, so anybody that wants to be in that market is going to be looking to buy this bank. Okay. And that interesting thing you just said there about uh, activists that you follow. And when you, you know, you do your homework on a stock and you want to see, you know, if uh, someone else is, uh, you know, agreeing with your analysis. I know you have a handful of people or, you know, investors that you, that you like to follow. Could you just, uh, you mentioned, I think it was Michael Price you mentioned there. Uh, who else kind of subscribes to the Tim Melvin deep value investing? Well, I think when it comes to banks, I follow them more, way more than they follow me. Okay. But, uh, when I look at the at the bank spot and really to to really maximize success, the activists and bank stock specialists are the key to this. You have such a it just tips the odds so far in your favor. It's like being able to bet on American Pharaoh but getting ten to one odds. Ooh. Yeah. So we follow guys like EJF Capital uh, out of uh, Virginia, Joseph Stillwell uh, out of New Jersey, uh, Lawrence Seidman, an ex SEC attorney out of New Jersey. Casting Capital, Patriot Financial, uh, Clover Partners. You know, when you see these guys in a stock, uh, Basswood is Partners is another one. You know that they're talking to management. They know what they want to see happen, and they're going to push for it. Um, Joseph Stillwell and Lawrence Seidman, in particular, they just they have a huge hit rate. They either get the bank sold, or they talk. You know, force management to do a buyback. They take board seats. Um, they're forcing the banks to unlock shareholder value. So when you come along and you see a bank trading at 80% of book value and two or three of these guys are involved, um, it just makes more sense than anything else you could possibly do with the money to buy the stock. I want to ask you one. I know I asked you about this before. Uh, you know, I'm from Monroe, Michigan and been a follower of Monroe Bank and Trust for a long time. And back in 2011, 2012, I've, probably bought more of this stock of the dollar than I should have and was <laughs> all prepared for it to go under. And uh, my target was $5 and held it for three, two, three years. And that's a long-term trade for me. Got out at five and I said, I need to get back in. I need to get back in. I need to get back in. And I'm not. And here it is, <laughs> knocking on the door is $6. Uh, could you give us uh, your outlook? You really, I mean, that is a tightly held bank. I mean, those people in Monroe, I just can't see them selling out. I mean, aside from a takeout, do you see uh, Do you see any value in this stock? Yeah, I mean, it's 95% of books, so it's up a little bit for me. Um, but, you know, there are strong activists in this stock okay okay so don't rule out a sale you've got patriot financial and castle creek both with eight and a quarter they kind of recapped the bank you know refinanced them uh but you've also got basswood in there uh bank funds llc and a few others they're at least talking to management about what needs to be done to improve the bank and uh monroe bank did in fact you know really rework their balance sheet disposed of all the bad loans that they had up there in the detroit area and now they're a much stronger, more sound financial institution. Their non-performing assets are, you know, in line with the industry. Um, 
and uh, they rebuilt capital so their capital levels were high enough for them to do fun things down the road like buy back stock and pay dividends. Okay, and uh, of course, you know, the whole economy, the whole uh, um, uh, auto sector is coming back. I think one thing that uh, – what catalyst that they were looking for, I know uh, a few DTE was looking at maybe, you know, improving, put, adding some more jobs there. So that's kind of what you, you know. You can have the activists in, but you need the grassroots. You need, a, you know, new jobs or, you know, a new industry in there to come in to give it, you know, help out the home loans and stuff, whatnot. Uh Before I let you go, Tim, I definitely want to talk to you about the big banks and the recent move in the financials here. And this market's just been so prone to just rotating money in and out. It seems like right now, you know, the money has been pouring into financials. I mean, a stock like Goldman Sachs is now finally back at, uh, you know, pre-crash levels. Uh, What do you think? You think this is just a, you know, a short-term blip as, uh, you know, money rotates or... Is it because the anticip- anticipation of interest rates going up? Uh, talk to us about the move into the big financials. It's, I, I think it's anticipation of the interest rates going up. But, you know, I've got to qualify that with saying that over the years, I've learned that for this to work for me, until it hits my screen, I don't pay any attention. And if somebody will say to me, the big financials move today, if they weren't trading from below book value to start with, I have no idea it happened. Could you, do you have something up where you could tell me where, like, Goldman Sachs, I know it doesn't really fit your, your criteria, but, uh, you know, where, where Goldman or Morgan, you know, really the only two investment banks left, could you, do you have where they're trading according to uh, relative to book? Oh, okay, well, Goldman Sachs, and this is my problem with big financials, by the way, they're trading at one and a quarter times book value. The problem is that book value is derived from so many non-traded instruments, stuff that nobody knows how to value. Um, so could you liquidate Goldman Sachs uh, for book value? No, of course not. There's too many moving targets in there and too many mark to model. So getting a grip on what a large, finan- a large financial company really is worth is one of the most difficult things you can do. Okay, I know, I know you like to avoid those, but uh, you know, what about like a Citigroup or something like that? I mean, that's getting got some love from Goldman Sachs last week. I mean, where, where? I mean, for me, I just think of that stock as a five dollar stock, you know, perpetually. What the, <laughs> it probably, it probably, you've got the same problem with Citigroup. It shows it's trading at eighty three percent of book value. But you tell me what that bond portfolio, mortgage backed portfolio, derivatives portfolio that they're trading are really worth. And then I'll tell you what the bank's really worth. And uh, my basic working theory is I don't know how to do it, so I don't worry about it. So if someone held uh, uh, your arm behind your bank, your back and said, Tim, you have to buy one of these big banks, would you just go to your scan and see which one was trading below book value or would you? Uh... Deepest, yeah, deepest d- discount to book value as long as it wasn't Bank of America. Okay. It is? As you said, it was Bank of America? It, it, it might be, but if it was, I would, I'd buy the next one up. Okay. Do you uh, uh, what's your outlook for the market here? I know you like to focus on your individual stocks. Do you have anything in besides the fact that um, you know, we are trading, you know, way off or not way? We just come off the all time highs. Is there anything you see in the market that uh, is troublesome to you? I mean, let's just go to interest rates. I mean, typically the market has performed pretty well for a year to to two after a small interest rate rise. You think that would be the the case this time? Can you say typically? You can't say typically here because typically we've never had five years of zero percent interest rate policy from the Fed before the first move. So everybody's so jittery because they don't know what's going to happen when rates start to go up because historically we have never been here before. So we don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be great for my small banks, what it's going to do for the market, which is absolutely addicted to zero interest rates, I don't know. Uh, but I'm kind of in the camp with Carl Icahn, who said last week, guys, it's not if, it's when we get a major pullback in the market. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I know you're also, uh, we're dabbling in the oil patch a little bit. And uh, there was one, st- I can't think of the name of the stock. It was giving you a little bit of problems. Uh, any, any, if, yeah, what was if you're it? Talking about, if you're talking about Hercules Offshore, we, we punted on that one. You did? Uh, yeah, when we started going through the uh, books, we realized that we had stress tested when we bought it for like 60 to $70 oil, but we never stress tested for 40 
And at 40, these guys couldn't survive. So we kicked that one out and, and just reassessed how we valued all commodity related companies and really tightened up the, the controls on that. That's, uh, you know what, that's, that's what people need to do is uh, they reevaluate. You were, you were given a different set of circumstances here and uh, you know, you have to deal with uh, the consequences, but so well, I, yeah, I mean, with, with oil at 80, I thought I was being really conservative with 60, <laughs> but I wasn't. So, you know, I was just totally wrong on that. We, just kind of restructured how we look at commodity related companies and the uh, margin of safety factor we look for now is a lot bigger. And uh, just as far as commodities in general, the gold market here, uh, you know, sometimes when there's a bump up in interest rates or the money exiting the market, it goes into the commodity markets. Uh, any, any feel for that? I mean, just let's just basically mm -hmm. go with the, the, commodity that people knows the most know the most besides uh oil and, and that's gold any take on the gold market not not at all um i'm good at, there's two things in life that i'm good at and i figured it out when it comes to the markets one is small banks and one is stocks trading at a substantial discount to book value with a large margin of safety i don't know where gold's gonna go um i don't think gold is really the store of value that it used to be um because if you talk to a gold bugs and realize that if their scenario actually played out, gold's going to be as worthless as everything else. The only thing with real value is going to be tin cans and bullets. <laughs> and, and you, I guess uh, bullets, uh, you could go with guns on that. We've been yeah. on, <laughs> Any stocks out of the chat here before we let uh, Tim go here? I have one popping up. Hero? I don't know if that was one we talked to you about. That, that's that's Hercules Offshore. Oh, we kicked it. that okay. one out. Yep, that's right. Okay, we've been, we've been on the line here with uh, Tim Melvin. He's the author of the Deep Value Letter, giving us just a much different perspective on the markets uh, than we usually get on the show. And we really appreciate you having, having you on, Tim, and we're going to have you on again real soon. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great morning.